So we have come to the wonderful chapter 10 of the book of Acts, a chapter that means so much to us here today. Now there may be a Jewish believer in Jesus among us, but I suspect we are most of of us are what the Bible calls Gentiles. And so in this glorious chapter before us, we read that the door to the gospel is open to Gentiles. Not that there were no Gentiles who'd not received Christ up to that point. They had, I know at least, the Ethiopian eunuch under Philip's preaching was one. But it's clear, this is a clear and positive confirmation that men and women from all nations, tribes, peoples, groups, have access to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And that the gospel is for all people. This is the first case that we see where there's a need for the church to face the issue of Gentile converts. And it caused great controversy. The church had to recognize that this movement was going to be much more extensive than they ever imagined. Up to this point, it was uh, mainly Hebrew. Some of them were still prejudiced against any who were not Jewish. And up to this time, Christianity was sort of an offshoot of Hebrewism. As a Hebrew church, they worshipped in the temple, still kept the hour of prayer at the temple. As you remember, Acts chapter 3 The healing of the lame man there at the gate beautiful took place as Peter and John went to the temple. Peter and John went up together to the temple, the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a Gentile was not allowed in the temple, even if he was sort of converted to Judaism, he was still not allowed in the temple. He stood outside in the court of the Gentiles and was looked upon as being outside of the covenant. But now God is continuing his work in Peter's life that his prejudices might be removed. He saw the converts in Samaria. And then after the miracle of the raising of Tabitha from the dead, he stayed in the house of Simon the Tanner, which was not really kosher. A tanner working with animal skins and whatever and it's actually interesting that if a person got engaged to uh, Tanner, found out what he did for a living, you're able and <laughs> allowed to break off the engagement. So Peter lodged in fellowship with Simon and Tanner. But in general, the Gentiles are not really a part of the church up to this point. Now we're going to read of an incident that shook the church, namely the conversion of the Gentile Roman centurion Cornelius and all of his household. The news of which threatened to divide the church. And it began a controversy that later the apostle Paul, of course he had to struggle with it all of his ministry. So now look at Acts chapter 10 verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. He said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. That's sort of a challenging verse in the sense that uh, God heard his prayers. He's not a saved man at this point. God heard his prayers. Verse 5, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. 
this man probably had no direct influence from the Jews. Is a man of faith, though, and, a, a, in, and his family, a man of prayer, a generous giver. Interesting, a picture of a man not influenced by the Jews. He's from Rome, but he has a household that is sort of governed by a godly man. And his godliness at this point cannot be accounted for by either Christianity or Hebrewism. Jesus, the light that lights every man. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now Romans 1 tells us that God gives light that is seen by all. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and in their foolish hearts were darkened. So, according to what we read there in Romans 1, God reveals himself, and people are responsible for the light that has been given. And rejection of revelation leads to judgment, the wrath of God. Now, it's just the opposite condition with Cornelius, I believe is a rare case. A rare case of a man responding positively to the light of God that he's been given. And we think that in God revealing himself in creation. You know, people are without excuse. Cornelius said to be a devout man. He said he served God and he prayed. Even so, Still, he must be born again. Even the good guys, you see, need to be born again. Not just the obviously wicked people, but the moral, upright, good people too. And that's the problem for some people, because some good people seem to uh, have a hard time seeing the need for them to be regenerated, to be saved, to be born again. You think, well, why do I need a Savior? I'm a good person. I recall when we first met, when Carol and I first met Pastor George Yeomans, who led us to the Lord. Well, he, after the church service where we'd been preaching, he could see that we were heathen, and he took us into a side room to talk to us. <laughs> and he was, he was chatting with me, and the lady was talking to Carol. And when the subject of sin came up, Carol was heard to say, I'm not a sinner, it's my husband you want to see. <laughs> he was the one who wanted to come here. <clears throat> now, although she did not think of herself necessarily as a bad person, of course she knew she was not innocent. Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whatever we think of ourselves, good or bad, everyone fall short of the standard God has set. You see, what we see is on the surface. We just see the surface. God sees the heart. And God could see into the heart of Cornelius. And even this good man wasn't without sin. He needed the Savior, needed to be born again. So <clears throat> he, he's told that Peter is lodging, look at verse 6, with Simon and Tanner, whose house is by the sea, he will tell you what you must do. So here's a clue as to what God does for those heathen who've never heard the gospel. You say, well, what about those who've never heard? Well, I believe that God is perfectly just. You remember when Abraham was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah when God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, it was Asking him, well, if the 50 righteous, 40, 20, you know, got, got, got down to 10. If there's 10 righteous there, would you spare the city? And then he, Abraham said, shall not the, uh, the God of the whole world do right? 
shall not the judge of the whole world do right. In other words, God always does what's right. But here's a clue, you see. He says, he will tell you what you must do. So all of those who truly seek him will find him. Here's a man obviously seeking God. And I do believe all those who truly seek him will find him. If you seek, if you seek for him with all your heart, he's dead, you will find him. And God will send a messenger. However, I don't think there are many people like Cornelius. Most who have had some sort of revelation, have rejected it. As we read there in Romans chapter 1. They're sort of convinced in their heart that there's no God. And he's given them over to a reprobate mind. And we can't know God without his revelation. But God has given opportunity, given people light, <clears throat> given them truth. But most pe people suppress that truth. They hold back that truth from working in the life. Therefore, they bring judgment upon themselves. So verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So now it's Peter's turn to have a vision. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. You see, Peter had proclaimed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And in that sermon, he quoted the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward, I shall pour out my spirit on all flesh, he said. God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. But I suspect to Peter, all flesh meant all Jewish flesh. <laughs> However, his understanding is beginning to change, but he had much more to discover. So now all the ceremony aspects of Judaism blown away. Peter was to find out that God's salvation was for the Gentiles and that men and women we're going to come into a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ that had absolutely nothing to do with God's covenant with the Hebrews. Now with our hindsight, as we sit here today, it's easy for us to understand that and see that. But understand that Peter did not have the understanding at this time that we have. He didn't have the revelation of redemption that we have at this time, the ones that we do. You see, we have the writings of the New Testament from which we can learn about the grace of God. And we can be reading Romans and reading Galatians and learn of the grace of God. In Peter's day, it was not written. These were the first to hear the gospel, to begin to understand the gospel. So Cornelius has had his vision. That's pretty straightforward. Now, Peter's vision, that's a little more complex. In fact, you might say, it's a little weird. <laughs> Verse 10. And he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Sort of a condition of ecstasy, worshiping the Lord, and he's, he's gone. He saw heaven open, verse 11, and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. What a weird vision. I mean, you might be thinking, what's he been drinking? I mean... <clears throat> That's a weird, weird vision. But Peter said, no, not what he says. He's, he's told, rise, kill and eat. And he said, not so, Lord. <laughs> I'm a good Jewish kosher boy. <laughs> he said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Wow. <laughs> There's a bit of a contradiction there, isn't there? You don't say, not so, Lord. You can say, 
Not so, I don't think you should, but you can say not so husband. <laughs> or not so wife. Or not so mate, not so fella. But you can't say not so Lord. That's a contradiction. But here he is, Peter, bless him. He's a good Jewish boy. He's kosher. He hasn't eaten anything yet. He says, I haven't eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again. The second time said, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. So the Lord swept away the ceremonial there. He did it three times. So Peter could not miss it. However, he didn't understand it. He didn't fully understand what it meant. Look at verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself, thinking, what was that? What this vision which he'd seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. <laughs> wow, that's a bit of a coincidence. Not at all. This is God's timing, isn't it? A divine appointment. Now, Peter's thinking about the vision. What did it all mean? I mean, for all he knew, he could now eat bacon. And to me, that would have been really good news. I love bacon. Thank you, Lord. I'd have gone downstairs and had a bacon sandwich. <clears throat> but you see, there was a, a deeper, greater meaning to this weird vision. You say, well, why didn't God just tell him straight? I'm going to save the Gentiles. Go preach to them. Well, you see, the Lord needed to deal with Peter's prejudice. And so God gradually prepared Peter for his plan in reaching the whole world. And also Peter, understand this, Peter needed this experience. He needed this vision so that later he would be able to support Paul the Apostle preaching to the Gentiles. Because there's a, a big controversy over preaching to the Gentiles. And this vision, of course, had to convince Peter. God showed him the converts in Samaria. He showed him the spirit-filled spirit -filled tanner. And now he's ready to see God's plan of salvation is much bigger than he ever imagined. So verse 17, we, we read about how he wandered within himself and there how in, in Simon's house there, they stood before the gate, the folks from Cornelius. Verse 18, and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has Good reputation among all the nations of the Jews was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house to hear the words, words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So there's these Hebrew Christians. There's an interesting gathering. You have a tanner, you have an apostle, some of the Hebrew Christians going with him and two Gentile servants and a soldier. <laughs> Interesting group. So they set off and, and God now is intending to answer both parties' questions by their meeting. Peter, not fully understanding what his vision meant, is going to get his answer by meeting Cornelius. And of course, Cornelius and all his household will be saved, receive the Holy Spirit and be baptized. So verse 24 and the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. So a side note here, a little slight digression. Peter and the other apostles and angels never allowed people to worship them. Now Jesus did. He didn't forbid people worshipping him. Only God is to be worshipped. They were mere men, as they admitted. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. So verse 27, And as he talked with him, he went in 
and found many who had come together. So there's a big crowd there. Cornelius has got his friends, he's got family. He said, hey, this guy's coming. And he's got, I tell you, he's going to have some stupendous things to tell us. We need to get together. He got a whole group together. And then he said to them, you know how it is unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. <laughs> he's got to get that in, hasn't he? <laughs> But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. I'm not going to call you common. He points out that, you know, I really shouldn't be here. Normally, you know, I wouldn't frequent the house of a Gentile. But God's given me this vision. And apparently now then Peter's beginning to understand the meaning of the vision. Verse 29. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius says, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in, a bright, in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your arms are remembered in the sight of God. That's amazing. Verse 32, send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon and Tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. Now, therefore, we're all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Can you imagine how Peter felt? He's had his vision doesn't know really what it means. These people have come and now he's been told by God to go with them. He's in the house of a Gentile somewhere he wasn't sure he was supposed to be. The guy's claiming that God's given him a vision and God told Peter that God told him that Peter would come so Peter opens his mouth verse 35. But in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, he is Lord of all. It's like he adds that. He, he sent to Israel. Oh, wow, he's Lord of all. It seems his preaching is coming to him as he's speaking. He's the vessel, isn't he? Being used by God in his preaching the gospel. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So put faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what you've heard about the cross and the resurrection and receive forgiveness of sins. Then verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these things, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So he's part way through his message. Now I'll tell you, no preacher, no teacher, no pastor likes to be interrupted halfway through his message. <laughs> Unless it's this kind of interruption, which is not a problem at all. I'll stop speaking, I'll quit speaking if the Holy Spirit falls upon all these congregation of people. So oh, there you go. I'll carry on then. <laughs> so before he can finish, they are believing. You see, they're believing all that he's preaching. They're ready. It's like fruit dropping off a tree. It's not hard at all to share the gospel with these people. They're ripe, they're ready to hear 
And as, as they hear it, they begin believing it. That Christ died and rose again. They believe in him. They put that faith in him. And that moment, it takes place. Wonderful. The conversion. As they're listening, they are believing. The Holy Spirit then is poured out upon them. And those of the circumcision, verse 45, who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on these Gentiles also. Peter's very smart here, taking these other Jewish people with him. But the Hebrew believers here that had accompanied Peter sort of blown away by this. Verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, so side note here, there's a slight digression, speaking in tongues is magnifying God. Clearly there. Verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Of course, he's referring to the experience they had on the, they had on the day of Pentecost. And these, as they listened, they believed and they were saved and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and they asked him to stay a few days. So, Although the Hebrews were not ready for this, they can't object because God has confirmed it by pouring out the Holy Spirit upon these people and showed Peter and the Hebrew believers that the gospel is for all people. Now, a few lessons for us to learn from this page, from this passage. First of all, number one, nothing is too hard for God. You believe that? Yeah. Nothing is too hard. He can do more than we can ever imagine. And in particular, the depth of love and compassion of God goes beyond what you and I can ever comprehend. The grace of God, the love of God, goes far beyond anything you can comprehend. And let me tell you again, God loves you. God loves you. Christ gave his life for you. Now, if you're sitting there doubting that, you say, well, I don't know, how, I don't know if God loves me. I, I don't know whether he does really, truly love me. Don't doubt that. In fact, it's a sin to doubt that God loves you. You need to repent of it. Because God does love you. Then secondly... The conversion of the household of Cornelius shows us how vast the love of God is. Shows us how far reaching the gospel is. That he includes those that perhaps we would leave out. Perhaps we do not think of ourselves as prejudiced. Maybe we don't we think of ourselves that way. I think there may be some people we think, I don't know whether I can share the gospel with them. I remember when years and years ago when I had my band and we would go over from California, I'd take my band and a team sometimes to go uh, minister in England. And we were singing this one particular night, doing our, our music one particular night, and I was speaking in this basement of a church. It's got a coffee bar down there in Rotherham. And... As we're doing our concert and singing, we're used to people listening and paying attention. Well, these kids, they were punk kids or whatever. They were being a nightmare. They were just yelling things, distracting, goofing off, throwing stuff, being really obnoxious. And there were two guys in a, in a band who couldn't handle it. They got really mad at them. You see, couldn't. Those guy, I don't know, we should, we can't, we can't do our, our music here. And then there was me and one of the other guys in the band said, wait a minute, God loves these guys. These are just the people he sent us to. And we're able to, we're able to share with them. Some of them did come to know the Lord, but the, but it was evident to me that, that a couple of fellas in the band were like, I am, no, these are not the people we're supposed to be sharing with. We need to share with people who are going to listen. <laughs> well, God loves them all, and he expects us to love them. I mean, does God love Muslims? There's one young Iranian woman, convert. she told a German news magazine, Stern, I've been looking all my life for peace and happiness, 
but in Islam, I have not found them. Another convert told Stern that he'd found in Christianity an element of love that was missing from the faith that he was brought up in. In Islam, we always lived in fear, he said. Fear God, fear of sin, fear of punishment. But Christ is a God of love. So he loves Muslims. He loves Hindus. He even loves those annoying Jehovah's Witnesses that knock on your door (laughs) uninvited. What about Democrats? No, wait a minute, you're going a bit far now. Going a bit too far now. And you Democrats, God loves Republicans. Even Donald Trump. And Joe Biden. Yes, he does. Make no mistake, though, to be saved, all must come the same way. All must come through Jesus Christ. But the point is, All may come if they will. None are excluded. Not even Nancy. All can come if they will. Number three. God uses human vessels. Why didn't the angel just tell Cornelius the plan of salvation? In a division of the angel. Why don't you angel say, you know, you've, you've been praying and seeking God. Let me tell you about Jesus. <clears throat> no. <clears throat> he wasn't permitted. His job was to tell him to send for Peter. For it is people like us that God uses to spread the gospel. Angels are not given the privilege to spread the gospel. We are. Now, a slight digression. There will be a day during the great tribulation after the church has been raptured that an angel will preach the gospel. You read of it in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Incidentally, That fulfills the words of Jesus when he said the gospel would be preached in all the world before the end comes. So those of you that have been questioning that, saying, well, you know, sometimes I hear preachers say Jesus is coming soon, but he can't come because the gospel has not been preached all over the world, has it? Well, it will be by this angel. That answers your question. It it will be. He'll do what we may have failed to do. There will be the gospel preached to all nations, all tribes, all tongues by this angel. But that's not now. And the privilege and the responsibility has been given to us. And it'd be very wrong of you to say, well, an angel's going to do it after, so we're all right. No, the privilege, the responsibility has been given to us. And I wonder if we understand what a privilege it is. How significant it is that God uses human vessels to do his work. But there is even more to it than that. You see, God was dealing with Peter also. As well as dealing with Cornelius. Well, God's working in Cornelius. God was working with, in Peter. And with, as he was dealing with Cornelius, he was dealing with Peter. And learn that the reason God sends you on a particular mission, and not me, or not an angel, is because God wants to do something in your life. I have a friend who, years ago, was so desperate to be in the ministry. It's when we lived in California. I don't know if I ever met anyone so zealous for God, and yet so frustrated how he longed to give all of his time, all of his energy to serving the Lord. But he had a, had a day job and he was serving, but he wanted to go full time as it were. He wanted to give up his job and dedicate all of his time, all of his talent to teaching the word of God and to evangelism. Well, we had lunch together at Ham's. <laughs> it was a restaurant in Costa Mesa, often frequented by the Calvary Chapel pastors called Hams. It's not there now, I don't think. Once again, he related to me his desire and his frustration wanting to be in the ministry. 
I asked him, why do you want to be in the ministry? Well, he said, but because I, I just want to see people saved. I, I just want to teach the word of God. I want to dedicate all my life to just serving the law and teaching the word. Then I asked him, why do you think God would have you in the ministry? Why would God want to have you in the ministry? Again, same answer. Well, there's a lot of need. A lot of people, I'm just responding to the, you know, there's a lot of need. I really want to serve. And then it was one of those rare times <clears throat> where God, you know, he gives you the exact word. He gave me the right, just the exact word for him. And I said, my friend, if God calls you into full-time ministry, then primarily it is because of what God wants to do in you. That's a primary reason you're in the ministry. Why do you think I'm in the ministry? Why do you think I'm in church every Sunday? Because I'm in the ministry. God knows that. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> now, seriously, it's for what God can do in us. That's the primary reason, you see. And my friend became a very fine Bible teacher and writer, and he, he still tells that story today. And so with Peter, God could have sent anyone. He could have like had Philip continue on because he was an outgoing kind of a preaching guy, wasn't he? But God love, God's love goes beyond just getting his message out. Every individual is important to him. He sent Peter because he wanted to do something in Peter and for Peter. Peter's growth and development was as important to God as what Peter could do. You see, my friend, my brother, my dear brothers and sisters, you are more important to God than what you do for God. You yourself. Not what you achieve or what you accomplish or what you do. God loves you. Not your works. Not your ability. Not your talent. Not your money. God loves you. And he is continually at work in your life through all the circumstances that you face. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so in closing, I repeat the fifth point. The gospel is for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The whole world. God loved the whole world. Not just a select elect. Not just a privileged number. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For everyone. None are excluded. That which Christ accomplished on the cross, namely bearing of our sins, is for everyone. And for that sacrifice to be efficacious in your life, it is necessary for you to believe. Not just with your head, not just giving mental assent to sort of an intellectual acceptance of facts, but with your heart, which in turn will affect your will. And here's the wonderful thing. God sees and God knows when that happens. As evidenced by what we read here in the house of Cornelius. We don't know. You see, we can assume. We can rejoice when we see a person respond. Perhaps they come forward in an altar call. They respond to the gospel. We can rejoice in that. But only God knows what really happens in the heart. I remember seeing... <coughs> an egotistical evangelist in the office there at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, kind of boasting on how many were saved in response to his preaching. We used to get a lot of people coming to the Saturday night concerts there at Calvary, Costa Mesa, and, and uh, there were a lot of people went forward. And he was boasting. He was saying, oh yes, over 100 were saved last night at the concert. I'll never forget his face, and I'll never forget what, and Pastor Chuck's response. He just simply said, how do you know how many were saved? <laughs> Poor guy, you know, I think he went white as a ghost. You see, you can 
count how many people come forward. But only God knows how many people are saved. And according to what we see here at the house of Cornelius, you may not even have to come forward. You may not have to say this in his prayer. Do you read of him saying this in his prayer? And Cornelius and his group all said this in his prayer and the Holy Spirit fell on them. It doesn't say that. Something happened and it's between God and you. Not me and you. Not the evangelist in you. Not the musicians in you. God in you. And it happens when, I don't know how I would put it. There's a spark, as it were. So you believe. And something wonderful happens between you and God. And you're saved. Something wonderful happens. And only it's <laughs> between you and God. And God reads the heart. You know, a, a while ago I talked about, uh, well, well, we only see the surface, but God sees the heart. And that was in the relationship to he sees sin when we don't see it. But, you know, the other is also true. God knows when you believe, when you're born again. God reads your heart. He sees it. And the moment you believe with your heart, be that coming forward in response to an invitation or sitting in your seat hearing the word or driving in your car listening to one of our teachers on WRDJ, or even on your deathbed when you're oblivious to those around you but you're still hearing the word of the Lord in your head and in your heart and you're crying out to the Lord in your heart. God sees and God saves. And the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people, even you even me. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this great chapter, Lord. It's so, such a blessing. Such a blessing to know that we're included and no one's left out. That you love all men and women with a great, wonderful love. And that, Lord, this is not judgment day. This is a day of grace. And we're able once again to declare your wonderful good news. So bless this to our hearts today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.